Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Roger Davis, and I am the chairman of the Bank of Queensland. And on behalf of the board, I would like to welcome you to the bank's 2017 annual general meeting. We are pleased that you have taken the time to attend it, and thank you for your continued interest and support of BOQ. I also extend a very warm welcome to all our shareholders and others who are listening to these proceedings via our webcast, particularly those interstate and overseas. Before we start the meeting, I would like to briefly cover off of two points of housekeeping. First, I ask that you please ensure that your mobile phones are switched off for the duration of the meeting, in courtesy to those around you. And I also ask that you do not use cameras, video or sound recorders during the meeting. Second, I would also like to outline the emergency and safety procedures in place in the unlikely event that these are required. If a fire alarm does sound, please prepare to evacuate, but wait until a member of the Hilton staff is present to inform you about the decision made, and if necessary, to direct you to the safest fire exit. Please note the fire assembly point is in the front of the hotel building in Elizabeth Street. The secretary of the company has confirmed that a quorum is present and accordingly I declare Bank of Queensland annual general meeting open. The notice of meeting was released to the ASX on the 24th of October 2017 and distributed to all shareholders and I will take the notice of meeting as read. I would now like to outline the format of the meeting. My introduction and address will be followed by an address by the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, Mr John Sutton. We'll then turn to the business of the meeting, during which you'll have an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. I will now introduce you to our Board of Directors and our Senior Executives, and I will ask each of the Board just to say a few words about their background and the competencies they bring to this fine institution. Seated on my far right, your left, non-executive director, Mr Richard Hare. Thanks, Roger. Good morning. Um, this is my sixth AGM, and I must say there's a, a really comforting familiarity emerging uh, about the, the feeling of the meeting and, and the attendees, so it's, it's a delight to be back here. I chair the audit committee of the bank. I'm a member of the IT committee and the risk committee, uh, and I sit on three other company boards. One is a listed trust. One is a small private family company and one is a government-owned corporation. Thank you. Next to Richard is Mr John Lorimer. John, a few words, please. Good morning. Um, I am a professional independent director and have been so for almost eight years and I also sit on the board of Bupa, um, your healthcare company. So if there's any questions around health insurance, I'll be happy to try and take those <laughs> as well. Um, uh, I've been on the board of Bank of Queensland now almost two years and I serve on the IT committee and the risk committee. Uh, most of my career has been in, my executive career has been in retail banking, commercial banking in two large global banks. So um, I, uh, I bring that experience and perspective and I must say that um, it's a great privilege to be on this board acting in your interests and um, you have a very fine executive leadership team and a very committed and expert board. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next to John is Mr Warwick Negus. Warwick. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm only in my second year as a director of the Bank of Queensland and I'm a member of the Investment Committee. Uh, in my executive career, I spent over 30 years in, in funds management and investment banking uh, in Australia uh, and Asia and Europe. Um, I'm on the board of a number of ASX listed companies, including the Brisbane based Virgin Australia. Uh, so I come to Brisbane a lot, which I enjoy very much. Thank you. Thanks, Warwick. Uh, next to Warwick is Karen Penrose. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Chairman. Um, I am 57. I'm a mother of two young adults, and I, in my executive career, I spent 20 years as a banker in roles very similar to what we do here at BOQ. For the other part of my executive career, I worked as a Chief Financial Officer, so I've seen banking from both the bank side and the client side. I now work as a full-time non-executive uh, director and serve mainly on listed boards, like BOQ in regulated industries, uh, a retail shopping centre board and another board that supports young Australians with mental health illnesses. I am delighted and privileged to serve on your BOQ board. Thank you. 
Thank you, Karen. Next to Karen is Mr David Willis. Thank you, Roger. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I too am delighted and privileged to be a part of the BOQ board. This is my eighth year as a director of BOQ. I have more than 30 years exper experience in financial services, including with regional banks as an executive quite similar to BOQ. I, also, I currently serve on four boards in the agricultural sector, in manufacturing and in insurance, and of course, in the banking sector. I serve on BOQ's risk committee, on the nomina on nominations committee, and I'm chair of the remuneration committee. Thank you. Thank you, David. On my left, your right, Managing Director and John Chief Executive Officer, Mr John Sutton, who you will hear a lot more from today, so apart from the fact that he's uh, an admirably excellent CEO, I don't think, John, any need for you to say anything more. Next to John is um, Miss Margie Searle. Yes, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm actually standing for re-election today, so I will say a bit more about myself later on at the time when we... Um, move that item, uh, but I'm a professional non-executive director and have been for five years and I really enjoy and delight in serving you on this board. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. Next to Margie is Michelle Trudenick. Michelle. Thank you, Roger. Um, I've been a member of your board for the last um, six years and it's uh, something that I enjoy and feel very proud and privileged to be. I'm also, like Margie, standing for re-election later on in the meeting, so to save you from hearing from me twice, I'll uh, save my introductions um, for that motion. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And last but not least, uh, Bruce Carter. Uh, thank you, Roger. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm standing for uh, re-election uh, today, so I will outline m my background more when to the podium. Um, however, I'm a chartered accountant based in Adelaide. Uh, I chair the risk committee. Uh, I'm on the audit committee uh, and the nominations committee and the investment committee. Um, and uh, I uh, enjoy my role at uh, Bank of Queensland very much. Thank you. Thank you all. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we have a board that represents our geographic diversity and is one that has considerable experience in our industry, along with other core competencies that are directly relevant to our strategy. With such diverse industry experience, we're delighted to serve you on our board, and I hope you enjoyed hearing the portraits of our executives and to try to get a little bit closer to what they do for you as representatives on your board. Continuing with the introductions, I note our General Counsel and Company Secretary, Ms Michelle Thompson, and Company Secretary, Ms Vicky Clarkson, are sitting directly in front of me. Also seated directly in front are other senior managers of management, namely the company's Chief Financial Officer, Mr Anthony Rose, the Group Executive BOQ Business, Mr Brendan White, the Group Executive Retail, Mr Matt Baxby, the Chief Risk Officer, Mr Peter Deans, Group Executive People and Culture, Ms Belinda Jeffries, and Group Executive Enterprise Solutions, Ms Donna Marie Vinci. Mr Robert Warren of KPMG, the company's external auditor, is also in attendance today and he's seated in front of me. Mr Warren will be available to answer questions regarding the conduct of the audit and the conduct and preparation of the audit report. I'd also like to welcome Ms Evie Bruce, a partner with King & Wood Mallisons, our lawyers, and note an apology from two former BOQ chairmen, Mr Neil Summerson and former non-executive director, Mr John Reynolds. I'll now turn to my meeting address. When you look back at the year, it's important to note that BOQ has again delivered a very solid set of financial results in 2017. And management is to be congratulated on this achievement as well as for successfully navigating many of the challenges that have impacted the industry during the year. These have included the introduction of a major banking levy, the prospect of a Royal Commission into Banking, which the Prime Minister confirmed would be held this morning, major compliance and conduct issues, allegations of anti-money laundering breaches, multiple government inquiries, new class actions, declining system growth, and several major new macro prudential policies affecting risk policies and compensation. These are substantive headwinds for the industry. But despite all these headwinds, BOQ enjoyed success operationally, financially and strategically as we continued to embed ourselves as Australia's most loved bank. And it's helpful at this time to reflect on that success, including the increase in cash earnings for the fifth successive year, 
to 378 million, which was up 5% on the prior year and included a 16% increase in the second half cash earnings. Strong common equity tier one capital ratios of 9.39%, up again 39 basis points from the 2016 level. Low loan impairment expenses of 11 basis points of gross loans and advances. Good expense control with underlying costs only up 1%. A 10 basis point increase in cash return on equity to 10.4%. And for our shareholders, for all of you, dividends totaling 11 cents per share, including an 8 cents special dividend. The market has recognised these achievements with BOQ enjoying the highest total shareholder returns, which is capital growth and dividends, for one, three and five years of any Australian listed bank, with the current return to shareholders a total of 26.5% for the year just passed. Our goal, however, is not just to outperform this year, it's to outperform consistently through a sustainable, long-term growth strategy that delivers superior value to our shareholders. And critical to achieving this goal is strategic optionality. To be successful over the long term, BOQ needs to embed in its operating model and business platform an appropriate degree of optionality so that we are well positioned for whatever challenges and opportunities that may arise in an uncertain future. Why? Because we all know that the bank of tomorrow will be different from the bank of today. So that as a bank we need to be prepared and ready to successfully pivot for whatever may eventuate. This journey, this commitment to transforming BOQ, to having strategic optionality and managing for sustainable growth is already underway. It's predicated on ensuring that we complete the digitization of the bank by achieving digital parity, that we have a strong balance sheet, outstanding adaptable leaders, a strong customer focused culture grounded on service excellence, trust and increasingly agile technology that emphasises anywhere, anyhow, anytime banking. We also need to have the right culture, the right leadership and an unambiguous understanding of obligations and the commitment necessary to continue and enhance our social licence. The criticality of culture and community trust in these circumstances can't be underestimated and the bank's executive team is committed to maintaining and enhancing these foundations. Indeed, I share many of the views of some of the major bank chairmen when I observe that the domestic banking industry at present, and indeed perhaps globally, needs to win back community trust. As an industry, we need to better explain the value that we bring to the community and the Australian economy, and in so doing, better preserve our social license to operate. This colours our future as an industry. And as a bank, whether or not we are directly involved in any of the banking scandals of late, we are indirectly impacted by negative community perception about whether bankers can be trusted to do the right thing. At BOQ, we are committed to changing this perception through an emphasis on ethics, full transparency, superior service and products and customer centricity. We've also now appointed our very own customer advocate to represent you, our customers not just the bank. And her name is Tanya Asakoff and she's here today and I encourage you to meet her. So we're making progress, ladies and gentlemen, on our journey to raise the level of trust in the bank, but we still have a long way to go before we are fully satisfied. Fortunately for us at BOQ, a majority of our customers and staff believe that we are different, that we do care about customers. We've also put in place a sound ethical framework to assist our people to make the right decisions. If we can leverage this and build on it, it arguably positions us for a brighter future. Our immediate future, of course, depends not just on our agility as a smaller bank or our customer centricity, our niche strategies, our planned digital transformation or the ability to pivot off a future strategy. It depends on the tailwinds of a solid set of financials and a strong economic environment. Certainly recent results show that we are well positioned for the future with a strong balance sheet and high capital levels strong liquidity, experienced leadership and outstanding asset quality and earnings momentum. But all these advantages can be dissipated in a weak economy where even the strongest struggle to swim against an ebbing tide. 
We are therefore heartened by the recent strong business condition survey results and the comments from the Reserve Bank of Australia that they expect GDP growth to pick up to an average of a bit over 3% over 2018 and 2019. Why? Because a rising tide helps lift all boats. And importantly, Queensland economic forecasts also confirm this more positive outlook for the state off the back of continuing low interest rates, strong growth in tourism resources, housing and public expenditure. We operate, of course, in a market environment characterised by high, high household indebtedness in a low inflation environment, a rising cost of living, weak income growth, underemployment and potentially higher interest rates. Now, this combination poses risk for the housing market if risk is not properly managed. This explains why BOQ maintains conservative serviceability and credit settings and monitors our housing exposures very closely, sometimes at the cost of asset growth. It also explains why the regulator is using tougher macro prudential policies to de-risk bank exposures and to better align system and income growth so as to ensure the ongoing integrity and health of the financial system. While speculation of a housing bubble or even a housing collapse in these circumstances continues, BOQ takes some comfort from moderating East Coast housing prices and risk conditions, especially in Sydney, and sees no evidence of any systemic weakness in our housing portfolio or substantive increases in its mortgage arrears. With a loan impairment expense ratio of 11 basis points across the entire portfolio and impaired assets of only $192 million, our risk portfolio would appear to be conservatively positioned. These key risk metrics are outstanding results by anyone's reckoning and reflect the bank's robust risk culture, our diversified portfolio and disciplined approach to risk management. However, as I said last year, we do remain wary of conditions in the residential apartment market, especially in Brisbane, where the RBA is warning that this year is crunch time given the oversupply low rental increases, tightening credit conditions and ongoing targeted macro prudential regulations. Now before I hand back to John, I want to make several other brief comments as to the bank's health and strategic ambitions. One is about the increased regulatory engagement and governance, two is about technology, three about customers and people, the engine room of the bank's future growth ambitions, fourth is about remuneration, and the final one is about the continuing need for a level playing field in Australian banking. Perhaps if I could start with the last point, the level playing field, and emphasise that at present, BOQ is competing against the majors with its hands tied in what all the regional banks believe is an uneven competitive landscape. As per our recent submission to the Productivity Commission, we believe this must change, that further policy reform is needed to not only reduce the artificial funding cost advantages enjoyed by the major banks, but also to address the significant gap that still exists between the capital requirements and risk weights of the majors and the standardised banks. Only then will we have a level playing field where our customers and shareholders will benefit. We need, in popular parlance, a fair go, and therefore welcome the comments from the ACCC that going forward, competition in the banking sector will be a matter of stronger interest. On remuneration, the continual focus on this and levels of remuneration in the banking industry, especially in the wake of considerable conduct issues and questions regarding the legitimacy of the industry's social contact, means industry reward schemes are increasingly now under the spotlight. BOQ is now in the process of responding to the banking accountability regime, also known as BEAR, an unfortunate acronym, the ASIC and Sedgwick's reviews and a host of other regulatory actions. Assisting us in this compliance task is our robust and arguably dynamic remuneration policies, which we continually adapt to reflect community attitudes and which we have received good report, support from proxy advisors and investors. I believe this is because we listen. Our robust compensation policies clearly emphasise the link between returns to shareholders and employees, paying for performance and clear benchmarking. Under this model, if the bank does well, then so too are our employees and vice versa. It's a fair and well accepted remuneration framework and it works with total shareholder this year of 26.5%. In terms of technology and having an operating platform that's fit for purpose, I don't need to lecture you all 
on the increasing digitization, disruption and change that is occurring in financial markets. It's substantial, it's rapid and seemingly has no end and unfortunately there's no obvious playbook for success. We therefore need to be positioned to not only protect BOQ from these disruptive changes and protect our franchise, but as an agile challenger bank, we also need to be able to take prompt advantage of changes so as to better serve our growth prospects and achieve sustainable growth. Pleasingly, the bank's path to digital parity is underway, not only in our IT infrastructure, application architecture and core banking system, but in the back office and at the customer front end. Certainly the use of robotics, data analytics and artificial intelligence is increasing at BOQ, straight through processing via our mortgage hub is well advanced, whilst at the customer front end we're making numerous improvements. The time to yes has shortened dramatically from weeks to days. New, easy to navigate, mobile friendly and award winning websites at Virgin Money, BOQ Specialist and soon across the whole bank have been introduced with a positive response. Samsung Pay has recently become available. We've substantially upgraded our ATM network and we've also entered into a unique partnership for small businesses, SMEs, with Square Australia, a US fintech and digital money company. A few words on regulation, especially the increased macro prudential supervision of investor and interest only loans and the new bear regime which promises to substantially change the way all banks are managed and operate. And I haven't even got round to the other 15 or 20 existing government inquiries into the industry, not to mention this morning's announced Royal Commission. While some are undoubtedly directed to improving much needed trust and accountability in the sector, the cost and inequity of treating all banks the same and heavily penalising the smaller banks for the disproportionate cost of compliance with government inquiries is unfortunately often overlooked, despite the fact that the ultimate cost for this is paid by our customers and shareholders. The cost versus benefits of these reviews needs to be more closely reviewed to ensure pragmatic and meaningful outcomes that are in the interests of all shareholders. Finally, on customers. If we are to secure a robust future for BOQ, valued partnerships with our customers are critical. Our recent digitization initiatives, new service standards, OMB balance scorecards, improved times to yes, new icon branches and ATMs are all evidence of our desire to try to do better in this front, to differentiate and substantially improve our service and product offerings. The results of all these endeavours are reflected in our high net promoter scores which provide further proof that our journey to becoming the premier customer centric bank is well underway. This is what we call customer capital and as with financial capital, Customer capital needs to be diligently managed, grown and successfully propagated as a key platform of our growth agenda. In summary, 2017 has been a challenging year for all banks, but BOQ can hold its head high with increased profits for the fifth year running, continued momentum against its niche business strategic objectives, especially at Virgin Money, BOQ Specialist and BOQ Finance, excellent risk management practices and a sector leading total shareholder return of 26.5%. Yes, the outlook for revenue across the industry remains subdued as the regulator attempts to reduce system growth to the levels of earnings growth, but regardless we believe we have the right strategy, the optionality, the people and balance sheet to provide continued opportunities for future growth. Finally, in closing, I'd like to express my thanks to all our wonderful people whose work is critical because ultimately, despite all the digitization of technology, people do business with people, and we must never lose sight of that. Thanks also to my board colleagues for their hard work and support, and of course to you all, our shareholders, for all your patience and loyalty during the past year. It's been greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. I'll now hand over to the Chief Executive for his address. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roger, <clears throat> and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to, <clears throat> to be here today to update you on what has been a good year for BAQ in 2017. Our momentum in the second half of the year was particularly pleasing. This was achieved against a backdrop of industry challenges, including ever-changing regulatory and political landscape. Our niche segment strategy delivered solid results with BAQ specialists, BAQ finance, and our commercial lending tar target segments 
all performing well. Virgin Money has also made a strong contribution with the growth in its new home loan product ahead of expectations. Our asset quality remains sound with further improvement across a range of metrics. This is an outcome of a deliberate approach to improve risk management over the past five years. We've delivered on our expense targets and found savings throughout the organisation, which has allowed us to reinvest in the business. Our capital position is very strong. This provides us with a number of options in the future. Summarising our key financial results for 2017. Cash earnings increased by 5% over the year to 378 million. This included a $16 million profit on the disposal of a vendor finance entity. Excluding this one-off item, cash earnings increased by 1% to 362 million. Earnings per share increased 2% to 97.6 cents per ordinary share, also including the one-off. Return on equity increased 10 basis points to 10.4% and a dividend of 46 cents, including a special dividend of 8 cents per ordinary share, brought the full year dividend to 84 cents per ordinary share. The special dividend was made possible by a very strong capital position. The key drivers of this result include the following. Lending growth of 665 million for the full year, a net interest margin of 1.87%, which was down seven basis points from last year, a cost to income ratio of 46.6% and a loan impairment expense of just $48 million. The second half improvement was the highlight of the result. Lending growth returned in both the housing and commercial loan portfolios. Net interest margin rebounded in the second half to 1.9%. This was driven by a recovery in term deposit spreads, which we flagged at the first half result. We also saw a further reduction in our loan impairment expense. Our niche businesses grew further during the year. BAQ specialists delivered strong loan growth across both its housing and commercial loan books. BAQ Finance also made another strong contribution. Our business banking target segments have continued to grow, albeit from a small base. Loan balances in the niche business banking segments of agribusiness, corporate healthcare and retirement living, and hospitality and tourism increased by $309 million, $9 million to $1.5 billion. Asset quality resilience we have built into the bank is becoming increasingly evident. Impaired assets as a percentage of total loans was down to 44 basis points. Loan impairment expense was just 10 basis points of total loans in the second half. All portfolios continue to perform well across a range of credit quality <coughs> metrics. Overall, we remain comfortable with the health of the portfolio and there are no signs of systemic stress emerging. Thanks, Roger. Our disciplined approach to cost management is another highlight of this result. We delivered on our 1% underlying expense growth target. Underlying expenses was 510 million. We have not been cutting our way to greatness though. We are con continuing to invest in digitising our processes, which will have the dual benefit of improving customer experience as well as improving efficiency. Our customer deposit growth has also been pleasing. We've grown our at call transaction account balances at a compound annual rate of 9% since 2015. We have achieved even stronger growth in mortgage offset accounts at a compound growth rate of 32%. This growth in main bank relationships is important for, long -term, for the long term. Following APRA's clarity on unquestionably strong, we believe we're in a very strong capital position at 9.39% common equity tier one as at the 31st of August 2017. There are some tailwinds in 2018 which would further strengthen this position by 20 to 25 basis points. This provides us with flexibility to consider capital management options in the future. I am pleased to report that we've delivered on our strategic objectives. We have expanded the number of channels customers can engage with us, including increasing the number of mortgage brokers as well as enhancing our digital capability. We've continued to grow the right way, pricing for risk appropriately and targeting segments that value our relationship proposition. We have found better ways to do things to keep our costs under control 
while also investing for the future. And we continue to strive to be loved like no other through ethics, diversity, leadership and our people. Turning to the outlook and the environment we're operating in, there is a lot going on across the banking sector and the broader economy to consider. Regulatory, legislative and political pressures require banks to be more focused and nimble than ever before. Customers also expect more from their banks, particularly in terms of trust. On this last point of trust, we take culture and conduct very seriously at BOQ. We consider that culture of an organisation is critical to its long-term success. This is a race that never ends, but I do believe we're on the right track. We established an ethics committee back in 2015 and have completed the rollout of ethics training to senior staff and owner managers so our people have a clear framework to help them make the right decisions when it matters most. <clears throat> in terms of regulation and competition, we believe the playing field is still tilted in the favour of the major banks and there needs more to be done to address this. We've been advocating together with other regional banks that before any new regulations are introduced, greater consideration should be given to the impacts on smaller banks. Meanwhile, technology development continues to move at pace and with its customer expectations. For a bank to remain relevant in this environment, ongoing investment is required. Moving to our strategic focus ahead, we remain committed to our strategy of targeting niche customer segments that value a more intimate relationship. The four pillars of our strategy remain relevant and unchanged. Under the customer in charge pillar, we are seeking to improve our digital capability and deliver a seamless experience to our customers across channels. Our success in this pillar will be measured by the delivery of enhanced digital customer platforms. We will focus on growing the right way by improving our deposit gathering capability and increasing our main bank relationships. We'll price for risk while considering the broader relationship with our customers. Our main bank customer growth will be a key indicator of success for this pillar. We continue to look for improvement in all of our processes, removing friction points, with the aim of ensuring quicker time to yes of all of our customers. In the current environment, we're targeting sub-inflation operating expense growth while still investing in our growth businesses. We remain committed to proving it's possible to love a bank. We'll demonstrate this by our continued focus on our customers and the value we create for them. We are rolling out a customer heartbeat program across the group to ensure we consistently meet our customers' expectations through a unified service mission. A key driver of our future success will be the delivery of our digital transformation. Initiatives we have in the pipeline include our new web experience platform for BAQ, as well as new internet banking platform and mobile app. Success on these initiatives will bring the bank closer to its customers. Additional services will be provided that we've not had in the past such as direct online foreign exchange. We also see good growth opportunities in our business bank. In summary, our niche strategy is delivering and positions us well for the current operating environment. Our distribution channels of Virgin Money, brokers, BOQ specialists and the branch network give us greater reach than we've ever had before. With system growth likely to slow, we remain cautious about the housing loan market. But we are rolling out a range of initiatives that will improve the way we do business and serve our customers. Our business bank has had an excellent second half. This has continued into the new financial year with a strong pipeline and settlements. We have delivered a sound result at the same time as making significant progress on transforming the business. While there is more for us to do, we are laying the right foundations for sustainable outperformance in the future. Our strong capital position provides the bank with a high degree of optionality. It gives us the capacity to grow faster. However, we are mindful of the trade-off between price and risk adjusted return in the market with a slowing system growth. It also allows us to consider using some of the excess capital to accelerate investment in the business to bring forward execution of some of the elements of the strategy. This is something we are exploring and if any decision is to be made, we would update the market accordingly. If we can't find the appropriate opportunities to, port, to deploy excess capital, it will be returned to shareholders. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the board. 
my executive team and all the group's employees whose collective efforts have delivered the results that we've discussed today. I'd also like to thank all of our shareholders for your ongoing support. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the formal business of the meeting. But before we proceed, there are a number of procedural matters which I must draw to your attention. As this is a shareholders meeting, only eligible shareholders, their attorneys, proxies and authorised representatives are entitled to vote or speak at this meeting. Each item will be discussed in turn and members will have the opportunity to ask questions on that item of business. John Sutton and I will endeavour to answer your questions as best we can, but we will call on those from management or other directors with particular expertise in those areas if necessary. So that as many questions and comments can be heard as possible, we ask that each member ask one question at a time. I know this is difficult, but one question at a time, please. Please save your questions on individual items until we reach that specific item of business. And I also ask that questions be confined to the business of the meeting and shareholder issues. If we have time at the end of the meeting, there may be an opportunity for further questions. Directors and members of senior management will also be available for a time after the meeting to answer any more specific questions that you may have. If you wish to ask a question, please make your way towards the middle of each aisle where an attendant with a microphone will be present to help you. Please present your blue or yellow card, your admission card, which denotes your right to ask a question and provide the attendant with your name. I wish to remind at this juncture that anyone holding a white voting card is welcome at this meeting but is unable to vote or speak. When I call on you, the attendant will introduce you and you may then ask your question. As previously mentioned, the meeting has been webcast, so I ask that you keep your questions brief and to the point so that viewers can hear the question clearly. If you wish to confirm custom account, registry or other operational issues, there will be BOQ and chair registry representatives available in the foyer after this meeting to assist with these inquiries. But in the interest of fairness, we don't want to hold up the meeting on routine operational issues that can be dealt with after the meeting. So we ask that you liaise with these representatives to cover off on those matters afterwards. In terms of voting, all eligible shareholder and proxy holders will have been issued with blue voting cards on entering the meeting, upon which a vote can be recorded against each resolution. If you are both a shareholder and a proxy holder, it's important that you complete two voting cards one in your right as a shareholder and the second as a proxy. All eligible non-voting shareholders will have been issued with yellow cards on entering the meeting. Proxy holders should note that all directed votes have been accumulated and recorded. Proxy holders with open votes who do not wish to abstain are asked to record a vote in favour of or against a resolution. If proxy holders want to vote percentages of their vote in different ways, you'll need to specify the relevant percentages on the voting cards. The sum of your votes, unfortunately, cannot exceed 100%. Can't vote twice. Following questions on each resolution, details of the proxies that have been received by the company from shareholders will be displayed on the screens behind me, and any open proxies that have been received by the directors, subject to the voting restrictions detailed in the notice of meeting for items 3, 4, 5, 6, 7A, 7B and 8, and in the shareholder having marked the appropriate box on the voting card will be voted in favour of each resolution. As set out in the notice of meeting, voting on all items will be conducted by a poll. In conducting the poll, I hereby appoint Mr Chris Healy of Link Market Services as returning officer. Link Market Services attendance will be available to collect your voting cards at the end of the meeting and will be available at the exits from this room. And results of the individual votes will be published on the ASX and the BOQ website as soon as they have been verified. I will note that the company utilises an electronic registration process for general meetings. I know this is all very complicated, so there's another byline here, if in doubt, ask. As an organisation, we encourage our shareholders to communicate with us electronically for your convenience. Around 46,000 shareholders now receive our annual report by email, which is arguably the most efficient way for shareholders to receive communications from us. It's also beneficial for the environment 
and represents a substantial cost saving for BOQ and our shareholders. Any shareholder that's not already done so would like to register to receive communications from us electronically can do so after the meeting by speaking with our BOQ and share registry representatives. We'll now proceed to the first item of business, which is the consideration of the accounts. We have KPMG to help us, as well as the CFO and the board. The first item of business listed in the notice of meeting is to receive and consider the financial report, the director's report, and the auditor's report for the company and its controlled entities for the year ended the 31st of August 2017. In accordance with the Corporations Act, there is no vote on this item. This item of business provides shareholders with an opportunity to ask questions about the reports and the management of the company. Any questions for Mr. Robert Warren of our auditor KPMG should initially be directed to me as chairman and I will then determine who is best placed to answer the question. I'm now happy to take any comments or questions that you may have in relation to the financial report or the management of the company in general. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions? All good. If there are no questions, I declare that the reports have been received and considered at the meeting and we will now move to the next item of business, which is the election of directors. Four directors being myself, Michelle Tredenick, Ms. Margie Seal and Mr. Bruce Carter are seeking election at this year's meeting. The biographical details of all directors are up for re-election and are set out in the explanatory statement that accompanied the notice of meeting and in the director's report on pages eight and nine of the BOQ annual report for 2017. As such, these details will not be repeated here in the interest of time and efficiency, beyond noting the individual director's longevity and involvement as a member of the BOQ board. Each director standing for election will provide the meeting with a brief address, and in accordance with BOQ's policy on the independence of directors, the board has determined that all directors up for re-election remain independent and able to exercise independent judgment to provide an objective assessment of matters considered by the board. All of the directors standing for re-election retire in rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and each election will be voted on separately. Now the first item <coughs> is my re-election, don't rush. This item of business is uh, important, obviously, and I would like to take the opportunity to address the meeting with regard to my re-election, noting that prior to its formal consideration, I will vacate the chair and ask Mr. Bruce Carter, as the chair of the audit committee, to deal with this item of business. Now, you've already heard a lot from me today, uh, and in standing for re-election, it's always, therefore, an interesting exercise working out what you should say to shareholders to support your bona fides, especially when you're chairman and thus have the privilege of occupying the podium for the bulk of the meeting. My wife would usually say less is more and how right she is. However, I've chosen on this occasion to ignore much of her advice <laughs> and use my few minutes on the stage to provide you all with a brief retrospective of how your bank, BOQ, has performed over master of my last two terms on the board as a director and chair for the period 2011 to 17. The proof of the pudding, as the saying goes, is in the eating, and shareholders during this, peating, this period have eaten very well. Certainly your bank, our bank, has achieved some remarkable results in that 2011-17 period, and whilst it would be grossly unfair to claim any of the credit for these achievements, shareholders should be delighted that in the period growth cash net operating profits has risen an extraordinary 114% in the period. Dividends have increased 56%, including 11% this year. Cash EPS and ROE have grown 37% and 30% respectively. And the share price, near and dear to all our hearts, has increased almost 84%, if my maths is correct. And the bank's total shareholder return outperformed the sector and the index since the lows of 2012 and is currently the number one performing bank, as I mentioned earlier, over the last 12 months and the three and five year period. Not bad, not bad, you'd have to say, not bad at all. And I am honored and very proud that my colleagues in the bank have allowed me to act as chief steward of the ship during most of this extraordinary run of success, which has also been boosted by some fabulous acquisitions and great management. 
The notice of meeting has already outlined my corporate history, so suffice it to say that I bring several competencies to the company, in addition to being a rugby wallaby player, although that's of football fame, not marsupial fame. In addition to passion and a strong commitment to BOQ values, I believe I offer the company and shareholders several distinct competencies if you re-elect me as a director. First, I believe my broad board experience, especially in financial services and the broader services sector, provides me with some invaluable insights into the health of the economy, contemporary corporate governance standards and the focus it brings on the choice of strategy. Also goes to say that having form as a banker before joining the board also provides me with an insider's view of banking and it's not without its advantages. I believe my leadership experience in managing and organising large companies both in Australia and overseas provides me with relevant and important skills, including that of risk management, and they are absolutely fundamental to the running of the bank, much as it may annoy the Chief Risk Officer that I seem to have views that don't always apply with his. Finally, I believe that my investment banking disciplines that I learned over my many years at Citigroup in the US and now at Rothschilds will help me add value to the company. We have been an acquirer, a successful acquirer over the years, and I'd like to believe that some of my advice and knowledge has been taken into account successfully. And finally, as I said at the beginning, I believe I'm a banker's banker, I know the regulatory environment, and I appreciate the importance of having strong management, strong capital and liquidity, good leadership, and I understand risk, that all-important four-letter word that defines bank success. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted and passionate about the opportunity to represent you on the BOQ board. I believe I have the requisite and skills necessary to do that well, and I therefore ask that you support my candidature for re-election. I will now vacate the chair and allow Mr Bruce Carter to conduct this item of business. Thank you, Roger. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, again. As you're aware, this item of business relates to the re-election of Roger Davis. Uh, Roger has served on the board of the Bank of Queensland since August 2008 and was appointed chairman of the board on the 28th of May 2013. Roger is the chair of the Nomination and Governance Committee and the Investment Committee and is a member of the Audit Committee and the Risk Committee. Roger also attends meetings of the Human Resources and Remuneration Committee and the Information Technology Committee. He was last elected as a non-executive director of the company in November 2014. The board, with Roger abstaining, recommends that the shareholders vote in favour of his re-election as a non-executive director of the company. Is there anyone who wishes to ask any questions or make any comments? Yes, ma'am. Mr Carter, shareholder, Mrs Buchanan would like to ask a question. Mrs Buchanan. Good morning. Uh, I'm Kelly Buchanan from the Australian Shareholders Association. Good morning, Mr. Davis. Good morning, Kelly. The ASA is here today to vote about $19 million in proxies from retail shareholders. And the subject of director remuneration is always a contentious one. And one issue is the equity position of members of the board. The ASA would be interested to understand the board's position about an appropriate level of commitment to the company by a director through share ownership. Uh, Roger, do you want to answer that? I mean, that's really not a question on Roger's re-election. So what I'm going to do is pass it over to Roger. Thank you, Kelly, and good to see you here again. Uh, yes, we have a, a, a policy of asking directors after three years to have at least one year's uh, uh, remuneration in uh, bank shares. Um, that proves at time to be problematic, uh, given the windows that are available for directors to purchase shares, uh, and we need to be uh, cleaner than clean in terms of uh, opening the window to make sure the directors can avail themselves. Um, so the unofficial policy is that uh, a full year's salary uh, and benefits to be vested in BOQ stock um, after a three year period. Thank you, Kelly. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, I will vacate the chair and ask Roger to reassume the position.
Bruce, you've got to go over the... Uh, you've got to put the resolution to the meeting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so close. My apologies, Roger. I formally put the resolution to the meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. So displayed on the screens behind me are the details of the proxies received in relation to my re-election. Please mark your voting cards in relation to my re-election. And um, thank you, Bruce, for your kind words. The next item of business is the election of Michelle Tredenick. I will now ask Michelle to address the meeting. Thank you, Roger. And you're, as always, a hard act to follow. So I won't bother to repeat Roger's words about the performance of the bank, I'll just note that I've served in the same period as Roger. <laughs> <laughs> so let me add my welcome to Roger's welcome to all of you as shareholders today, and thank you for taking the time to attend the AGM, which is a very important occasion. I've been privileged to serve as one of your representatives on the board since 2011, when I started my career as a professional non-executive director. Growing up in Queensland and attending both school and university here has given me a deep sense of pride in being able to serve one of Queensland's most iconic companies and one of Australia's strongest performing banks. My career as an executive has been in both technology and financial services as a senior executive across a number of Australia's top ASX 20 companies, mainly in banking and funds management. Today, as a professional non-executive director, I sit on boards across a range of industries, um, from the education sector to the sporting industry to insurance and superannuation and professional services. I'm also a member of the Ethics Centre Board and I also sit on the Senate of the University of Queensland. As such, I hope I bring a diverse range of skills and abilities to helping ensure that your bank is well governed. My role on your board encompasses chairing the IT committee as well as membership of the remuneration, nominations and risk committees. I'm grateful for your consideration of support for my re-election as a director of your bank and thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle has served on the BOQ board since February 2011. As she said, she's chair of the Information Technology Committee, a member of the Human Resources and Remuneration Committee, the Risk Committee, the Nomination and Governance Committee, and was last elected as a non-executive director of the company in November 2014. The board, with Michelle Tredenick abstaining, recommends that shareholders vote in favour of Ms Tredenick's re-election as a non-executive director of the company. Is there anyone who wishes to ask a question in relation to this motion? Mr Chairman, Shareholder, Mrs Buchanan would like to ask a question. This is a bit of a follow-on from my previous question. I was expecting it, Kelly. <coughs> yes, I know. Um, <laughs> according to my calculations, Michelle Trudenick has about 56% of her salary in shareholding, and she's been on the board for six years. So my question is, when do you envisage achieving an equity position consistent with the company's policy on share ownership by directors? Well, the, the policy uh, answer to that is as soon as the window is open, which hopefully will be after this AGM, but maybe I should ask Michelle. Thanks, Pete. Sorry, Kelly, go. I understand. Michelle, would you like to respond? Thanks, thanks Roger, and uh, thanks, Kelly. I, I do appreciate your point of view and the question, and yes, I am committed um, uh, to, maintain, uh, to actually getting to that position in the next available window. Kelly, just to respond, uh, the, the number of directors following series of our meetings on this issue that have sent requests yeah. to uh, the board seeking and management seeking permission to uh, normalise their sh shareholding um, has been quite overwhelming, um, but our uh, processes are such that only when we feel that it's the right time and the windows are open, having regard to the information directors have, will that be possible. Um, but your message is well and truly received. Um, 
Look forward to hearing from you again shortly. <laughs> You have indeed. If there are no more questions, I will now put the resolution to the meeting. The resolution before the meeting is that Ms. Michelle Tredenick, who retires by rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and being eligible, be re-elected as a director of the company. Displayed on the screens behind me the details of the proxies received in relation to the re-election of Ms. Tredenick. Please mark your voting card in relation to Ms. Tredenick's re-election. Now the next item of business is the re-election of Ms. Margie Seal. I'll now ask Margie to address the meeting. Margie. Thank you, Roger. Can everybody hear me? Good morning, everybody. It's terrific to be here this morning and uh, thank you for coming to the AGM. My name is Margie Seal and I've been on your board since 2014. I sit on the Human Resources and, and Remuneration and the IT Committee and today I stand for re-election. I'm a professional company director now, having retired from full-time executive life about five years ago, and in addition to the Bank of Queensland, I sit on a range of public company boards in the health, technology, telco, and property sectors. I have 25 years experience, senior executive experience in the global publishing, health, and consumer goods sectors, where my career was based in sales and marketing initially in fast-moving consumer goods. I worked in the retail sector with focus on, co on consumers and then became chief executive of various companies in Australia and New Zealand with responsibilities also in Asia. During my last executive role, which now was five years ago, I was the chief executive of publisher Random House, the publishing industry, when, when the publishing industry was disrupted as our products became the first products Amazon distributed online. And then they launched digital books with e-books. So I've had extensive experience in managing a company in a sector experiencing major change. As a non-executive director, all the sectors I work in are experiencing change as new, technology, as new technology models take hold, and this requires strategic and operational decisions about organisational structure, skills, products, data, and new channels to market. I believe my experience from involvement in, organization, in organisational change and business transformation in response to all these technological and digital challenges is of use to my um, role as a director at, at Bank of Queensland. In addition to keeping as close an eye on the future as possible, I'm also keen to foster curiosity and a learning culture within the company in order that Bank of Queensland remains a strong and sustainable business and also to assist the company manage risk and customers appropriately. I remain focused on improving the customer and consumer experience in all the sectors I'm engaged with, not least banking, and I hope to continue to do this with Bank of Queensland should I be re-elected today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margie. Margie, as she has said, has served on the bank board since January 2014. She's a member of the Human Resources and REM Committee, Information Technology Committee, and was last elected as a non-executive director in November 2014. The directors, with Ms. Seal abstaining, unanimously recommend that shareholders vote in favour of the re-election of Ms. Seal. Is there anyone who wishes to ask a question on this matter? Kelly? No? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> If there are no questions, I'll therefore now put this resolution to the meeting. The resolution before the meeting is that Ms. Margie Seal, who retires by rotation and in accordance with the company's constitution and being eligible, be re-elected as a director of the company. Displayed on the screens behind me are details of the proxies received in relation to the re-election of Ms. Seal. Please mark your voting cards in relation to Ms. Seal's re-election. The next item on the agenda, item 2D, is the re-election of Mr Bruce Carter. Bruce, would you care to say a few words? Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, I've been on the Bank of Queensland board since 2014. Uh, my background is that I'm a chartered accountant. Uh, I spent most of my career initially with Ernst & Young and then with Ferrier Hodgson. Uh, I'm based in Adelaide in South Australia. Uh, my career has been primarily uh, restructuring, um, uh, working uh, with debt, uh, and spending a lot of time with bankers uh, and financiers. So I really bring a, an entirely different perspective 
from a credit um, and a commercial perspective. Um, I've spent a lot of time working in, in regulated environments. I've chaired two insurance companies. I've done a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work with both federal and state governments and have been involved in a lot of inquiries and legislative change. I continue to work, my, my major work is as a, um, a non-executive director, but I still uh, am very much at the coalface of commercial negotiations and in the resources sector, uh, and in particular, I head up negotiations for various governments uh, with people like Arium and Nearstar and BHP in the resources sector. My current boards, um, I chair our nation's uh, submarine builder and maintainer and our nation's uh, shipbuilder uh, in South Australia, ASC. Uh, I, I am deputy chair of Sky City, which is uh, a company in the entertainment and casino business, um, runs a string of hotels, um, restaurants and other entertainment facilities. Uh, and I chair Aventus, uh, which is a very large property group. I'm also on the board of Genesee in Wyoming, Australia, which is a very large railroad company. Uh, and all of those roles enable me, hopefully, to bring a perspective um, that is diverse and valuable to BOQ. My main role at the BOQ is to chair the Risk Committee. I am um, uh, lucky enough to have Peter Deans, who is the executive um, and is considered uh, one of the great risk executives um, in this nation in terms of risk, and I work closely with him. Um, from a risk perspective, this bank uh, is in very good shape and it is reflected in the numbers. And as Roger said, risk is the key four-letter word that needs to be maintained and managed if you're going to have a good financial institution. A lot of companies espouse values and ethics and, and talk about how they should behave. And when I joined the BOQ, I thought it's, it's sort of wanted to be Australia's most loved bank. It was a bit quirky. Um, and some of the comments that came out were different. But indeed, that is the culture that, dri that is driven and drives the bank. And it's not just talk. It is actually the way that our executives, our board and all our people uh, look at the way that they should be judged. And it's reflected in the numbers. Kelly, you'll be glad to know, I think my shares uh, actually are OK. So uh, thank you. So I get ticked on that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm up for re-election. Uh, in the event that I am re-elected, I commit and look forward to serving you into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. As Bruce indicated, he has served on the board of BOQ since February 2014, is chair of the Risk Committee, a member of the Audit, Investment and Nomination and Governance Committee meetings and was elected as uh, non-executive director last in November 2014. All the directors, uh, with Mr Carter abstaining, unanimously recommend that shareholders vote in favour of the re-election of Mr Carter. Is there anyone that wishes to raise a question in relation to this motion? Thank you. If there are no more questions, or well, no questions at all, I now put the resolution to the meeting. And the resolution before the meeting is Mr Bruce Carter, who retires by rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and, being eligible, be re-elected as a director of the company. Displayed on the screens behind me are details of the proxies received in relation to the re-election of Mr Carter. Please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to Mr Carter's re-election. We now move on to item three, the grant of performance award rights to the managing director and chief executive officer. This is an ordinary resolution which relates to the grant of 99,239 performance award rights and any shares issued on vesting of these performance award rights to Mr John Sutton, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Bank, under the Bank's award rights plan. The terms and conditions attaching to the performance rights are outlined in detail in the explanatory statement to shareholders accompanying the notice of meeting but I would, however, like to also call out two contextual items in relation to this. First, ASX Listing Rule 10.14 requires the approval of shareholders where BOQ intends to issue securities under an employee incentive scheme to a related party. Mr Sutton is a related party of BOQ under the listing rules. Secondly, as a result of shareholder feedback, the Board has adopted a dual framework to offer greater flexibility for setting of appropriate performance conditions for performance award rights, details of which is in the notice of meeting. 
Before I put this motion forward, I'd also like to add that the three main proxy advisory firms that advise institutional investors have studied this resolution and have given their support to it, advising their clients to vote in favour of the resolution. Is there anyone who wishes to ask a question in relation to this motion? Thank you, Kelly. If there are no questions, I will now put the resolution to the meeting. The resolution before the meeting is that approval be given for all purposes under the Corporations Act and the ASX listing rules, including ASX listing rule 10.14 for the grant of 99,239 performance award rights to the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of the company, Mr John Earl Sutton, in accordance with the terms of the BOQ award rights plan and as described in item three in the explanatory statement. Displayed on the screens behind me the details of the proxies received in relation to item three. The company will disregard any votes cast on item three by all the key management personnel and their closely related parties, except where that vote is cast by them as a proxy for a person who is entitled to vote and does so in accordance with the directions on the proxy form. Please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to item three. We now move on to item four, the approval of future issues under the BOQ employee share plan. This is an ordinary resolution which relates to the future issuances of shares under the BOQ employee share plan. The terms and conditions of the BOQ employee share plan are outlined in detail in the explanatory statement to shareholders accompanying the notice of meeting. The board is seeking the approval of shareholders for further issuances under the BOQ employee share plan in accordance with ASX listing rule 7.2, exception 9. The company will disregard any votes cast on item 4 by all the key management personnel and their closely related parties, except where that vote is cast by them as a proxy for a person who is entitled to vote and does so in accordance with the directions on the proxy form. Is there anyone who wishes to ask a question on this motion? very compliant. Thank you very much. If there are no questions, I will now put this resolution to the meeting. The resolution before the meeting is that issues of shares under the BOQ employee share plan as described in the explanatory statement be approved as an exception to ASX rule 7.1 pursuant to exception 9 in listing rule 7.2. Displayed on the screens behind me are the details of proxies received in relation to item 4. Please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to item four. Item five, the approval of future issues under the BOQ restricted share plan. Now this is an ordinary resolution which relates to the future issuance of shares under the BOQ restricted share plan. The terms and conditions of the plan are outlined in detail in the explanatory statement to shareholders accompanying the notice of meeting. The board is again seeking the approval of shareholders for further issuance under the BOQ restricted share plan in accordance with ASX listing rule 7.2 exception 9. The company will disregard any votes cast on item 5 by all the key management personnel and their closely related parties except where that vote is cast by them as a proxy for a person who is entitled to vote and does so in accordance with the directions on the proxy form. Is there anyone that wishes to ask a question in relation to this motion? There being no questions on this motion, I will now put it to the meeting. The resolution before the meeting is that issues of shares under the BOQ restricted share plan as described in the explanatory statement be approved as an exception to ASX listing rule 7.1 pursuant to exception 9 in ASX listing rule 7.2. Displayed on the screen behind me are the details of the proxies received in relation to item five. Please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to item five. Now come to item six, the approval of future issues under the BOQ award rights plan. This again is an ordinary resolution which relates to the renewal of the approval of shareholders for issues of award rights under the BOQ award rights plan in accordance with ASX listing rule 7.2 exception 9. Terms and conditions of the BOQ award rights plan are outlined in detail in the explanatory statement to shareholders accompanying the notice of meeting. The company will disregard any votes cast on item 6 by all the key management personnel and their closely related parties except where that vote is cast by them as a proxy for a person who is entitled to vote 
and does so in accordance with the directions on the proxy form. Does anyone wish to ask a question? Thank you. There are no questions. I'll now put the resolution to the meeting. The resolution before the meeting is that issues of award rights under the BOQ award rights plan, as described in the explanatory statement, be approved as an exception to ASX rule 7.1, pursuant to exception 9 in ASX listing rule 7.2. Displayed on the screens behind me are the details of the proxies received in relation to item 6. Please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to item 6. And we now come to items 7A and 7B, which is the approval of selective buyback schemes in relation to BOQ's convertible preference shares. These are separate special resolutions which seek the approval of shareholders to allow the company to undertake one or more selective share buybacks in relation to the company's convertible preference share issued in 2012. Item 7A will, if passed, permit the company to undertake the reinvestment offer as detailed in the prospective lodged on the 22nd of November, which in effect allows eligible holders of convertible preference shares to reinvest those convertible preference shares in capital notes. Item 7B will, if passed, facilitate the company undertaking a redemption by way of a buyback of any outstanding convertible preference shares prior to the scheduled optional conversion redemption date of the 16th of April 2018, should the company elect to do so. The terms and conditions of the selective buyback schemes are outlined in detail as items 7A and 7B in the explanatory statement to shareholders accompanying the notice of meeting. Anyone that wishes to ask a question on this rollover facility? Okay, there being no question, I will now put to the meeting resolution 7A. The resolution before the meeting is that the conduct terms and conditions of the first selective buyback scheme in relation to the convertible preference shares issued by the company on the 24th of December 2012, as described in the explanatory statement, be approved. Displayed on the screens behind me are details of the proxies received in relation to item 7A. Please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to this item. I will now put to the meeting resolution 7B. The resolution now before the meeting is that the conduct, terms and conditions of the selective buyback scheme in relation to the convertible preference shares issued by the company on the 24th of December 2012 as described in the explanatory statement be approved. And again displayed on the screens behind me are details of the proxies received in relation to this item. You could all please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to item 7B getting there. Item 8. This is a non-binding resolution which seeks shareholder approval to adopt the remuneration port contained in the company's 2017 annual report as available on the company's website www.boq.com.au. Now, as noted, this resolution is advisory only and does not bind the directors. However, as many shareholders would be aware, if 25% or more of shareholders vote against a company's remuneration report two years in a row, shareholders may then resolve that a further general meeting be called at which all of the board, other than the managing director, must step down and submit themselves for re-election if they wish to continue on the board. The BOQ remuneration report was supported by shareholders in 2016. The report sets out the board's policies for director and senior management remuneration, including a discussion of the relationship of remuneration to BOQ's performance and other information required by the Corps Act about director and senior management compensation. I will note that the remuneration report has been defined again this year to incorporate suggestions made by shareholders. Before I put this to the meeting, I'd also like to make a couple of observations. We need to retain our people in a market that is highly competitive. We need to reward our employees fairly. We therefore believe that the bank should pay its leadership fairly in alignment with the performance of the company and competitively in alignment with the market conditions. Further, we believe that in alignment in terms of reward between the returns to shareholders and returns to management, we believe in paying for performance 
and the alignment of shareholder interests and those of management through the cycle. Finally, the board believes that most compensation should be at risk and not just an entitlement, that it should have a large deferral element and that it should be benchmarked. We, the board, take the view that entitlements and performance are inextricably linked and trust you support our view in this regard. Now, is there anyone that wishes to ask a question in relation to this motion? Thank you all. If there are no questions, I will now put the resolution to the meeting. The resolution before the meeting is that the remuneration report for the financial year ending the 31st of August 2017 be adopted. The company will disregard any votes cast on item 8 by all the key management personnel and their closely related parties, except where that vote is cast by them as a proxy for a person who is entitled to vote and does so in accordance with the directions in the proxy. Displayed on the screens behind me are details of the proxies received in relation to item 8. And I ask you all to please mark the reverse side of your voting card in relation to this item. Now, you'll all be pleased to hear that this completes the discussion of all resolutions contained in the notice of meeting. I thank you for your support. I hope you voted correctly. Could all shareholders please complete and sign their voting cards now as required? And they will be collected as you go out the door. Democracy at work. Before I close the meeting, however, uh, you're doing that, are there any other questions from the floor that shareholders wish to ask? Gutsy play, Roger. Sir. Oh, just hang on, we got... Chairman, shareholder Rodney Kendall would like to ask a question. Um, Mr Chairman, as an ordinary shareholder, there are approximately 250 days of the year in which the window is open for me to obtain Bank of Queensland shares. Therefore, I was wondering if you could enlighten me and perhaps other shareholders as to what determines when the window is open for members of the board to obtain Bank of Queensland shares. Thank you, Rodney. It's a very good question. Some of my directors ask the same question when they seek approval. Um, it's information that the board has about potential uh, actions that would place them at an advantage to ordinary shareholders that were not aware of that information. Um, as I said, we have to be like Caesar's wife, above reproach here, um, and we err on the conservative side. Um, uh, some may say too conservative, but we believe that as a bank, uh, and with your interests at heart, it is inappropriate for directors to cross that line and purchase when there's even a suggestion that they have an advantage over ordinary shareholders. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, and it could relate to a capital markets issue, a transaction, a sale of a business, the employment of a senior executive, uh, any of those issues that could have a material impact uh, on the share price uh, or provide existing directors with an advantage over those that weren't so informed. Okay, thank you. Chairman, Mr Ron Cullen would like to ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like, I was a bit surprised that uh, in putting resolutions 7A and 7B that you didn't tell us anything about the reinvestment option. I think that it would be important for us to know what is being proposed there. Thank you, sir. Uh, and clearly, uh, we haven't yet released the prospectus with the details. This is a, just an in-principle approval that allows us to conduct uh, the buyback and the reissue. Um, I'm not sure there's anything else we could say in terms of the terms. Evie, would you like to, as counsel? No? Why don't you speak to our counsel for the issue that can perhaps give you a better guidance. But at this stage, there is no prospectus, and therefore there technically is no no buyback, it's just an option that we wish to be able to have. Um, and you would then have to consider the terms of the buyback um, when you receive the prospectus and the notice of the rollover. I thought that in view of uh, this being a company that uh, likes to be fair to its shareholders, that maybe it would be helpful to present it to the meeting so that we could see whether you were sticking to your principles in that respect. Completely understand, sir, and uh, understand the sensitivity, and there 
I think if you could have a chat to our general counsel, she may be able to, uh, external counsel may be able to help you in, in that regard. Do you want to come up here? So the, the reinvestment offer relate, is relevant for those of you who hold convertible preference shares today. So it's not relevant for those of you who own ordinary shares, just those who own convertible preference shares. There was a prospectus that was lodged, I think on the 22nd, so last week, which um, sets out an offer of a new security that, that BOQ is offering, which is called Capital Notes. This reinvestment offer allows you to effectively sell your convertible preference shares and, and receive in exchange new capital notes. So it allows you to exchange your existing investment for a new investment. Is that a sufficient answer to your question, sir? You'll have to look in the prospectus. It's BBSW plus a margin of... Yeah, it's uh, three. <laughs> Anthony can answer that question. Um, there is a range uh, in the prospectus of 375 to 395. Um, and uh, that'll be finalised when the uh, replacement prospectus is lodged. No, it's an amended prospectus that has the new rates in and it has the, reflects the approval that you have just given us today. We couldn't do a buyback until such time as you all approved that, as was part of the conditions in 7A and 7B. Yeah. But the market, sir, has, has changed. Uh, you don't have to sell your CPS shares. Uh, you can hang on to them, you can swap them, you can roll them over. Uh, bearing in mind that there is a conversion date uh, in April. So I think suggest that you all see the prospectus, the amended prospectus when it's out, and that should answer most of your questions here. Uh, but it is, I think, as Evie said, um, uh, it relates, does not relate to ordinary shares. It's a hybrid. Sir. Chairman, Gary Bilby has a question. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Uh, with regards to that uh, situation with the uh, announcement of the capital notes offer, I noticed that I received a letter dated the 22nd of November that says here, a copy of the prospectus and a personalised application form will be sent to eligible CPS holders once the reinvestment, opens, reinvestment offer opens, which is the 30th of November 2017, which is today. So when can we provide that information to us with regards to the personalised application form and prospectus? Well, Anthony, do you want to answer today that? Today is the 30th of November. Um, as the Chairman just identified, uh, obviously a key condition of um, the process for this transaction, which is the capital notes transaction, was the approval of 7A and 7B. Okay, so it will, be today, it will be this afternoon. This afternoon, okay. Yes. That'll be electronically available. I don't think you'll get a personal note. I realise that because it actually says WW. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Mr Chairman, shareholder Mr Henry Kay would like to ask a question. Yes, good afternoon, Mr Chairman. I'd like to ask, as regards employee engagement, would the CEO like to consider the model that NAB are using? They have a community links division within that company and they, in, they really get their staff out there in the community. Would the company would consider that as an option for employee engagement? Uh, we, we have um, uh, sound employment <laughs> engagement systems right throughout the bank, and uh, we work very hard at that in terms of providing training to our staff and around our core values, and also particularly around our ethics training. Uh, we also do considerable work also in the community. So uh, I'm very pleased with where the bank is at with its employee engagement and it's something that we will continue to work on and it's very, very 
important uh, from our institution in the form of trust as we work with our customers. Well, I'd like to also do a follow up there. There's a lack of employee engagement in the Frankston area, Mr. Chairman, your local branch. The manager there hardly gets out in the community. The area has a 21.2% of the population with a disability, also a high deaf population and high youth unemployment. Now, I believe this is an opportunity for this bank to get out in the local community because they hardly know of Bank of Queensland. Also, not just that, as regards outsourcing, I'd like to suggest to you when you're outsourcing any function, look at organizations like Vatmai Industries, Oakley Sandy Industries, people like that, rather than send it overseas and keep the jobs in Australia. Thank you Th very much. Th Th thank you for your question. I just want to um, <clears throat> reassure everybody that we don't do uh, offshore outsourcing. Uh, our jobs are in Australia and uh, also, we do quite a lot of work in the community. The executive committee uh, visits, uh, has visited regional Queensland and has visited Melbourne on many occasions. And I do hear what you're saying about the Frankston community and uh, we'll certainly look to see if we can do more in the Frankston community as well. Good I thank you, you for your question. Well done. Thank you, Henry. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are there any more questions that you wish to ask, sir? Chairman Joseph Pura has a question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my question is regarding uh, cryptocurrencies and the phenomenal rise yeah. which they seem to have had since 2009. Has the board um, uh, have any views or has it been discussed on the board the risk and also the rewards that could be had from the introduction of those? Well, it's certainly a very topical uh, issue uh, in the financial community, given the extraordinary uh, performance of the, uh, the Bitcoin. Uh, we have not talked about this as a, uh, as a product offering. What we have talked about is the underlying blockchain technology, uh, which has uh, substantive implications for financial services company in embedding trust uh, between counterparties. Um, we look at the technology. Uh, the board was in uh, the West Coast spending time studying it uh, 18 months or so ago. Uh, but in terms of a currency uh, option or an option for investors at this stage, it hasn't come to the board. Uh, the executive may have talked about it, but... Um yeah, we're very interested in the underlying technology because uh, blockchain can actually take away a lot of... potentially take away a lot of friction amongst banking services. I will note that Bitcoin did suffer a 20% fall overnight last night. Uh, um, but you know, the, the underlying technology is, a great in, is of great interest to the whole industry, and uh, you know we closely look at it uh, amongst the executive committee to see what we may be able to do in the future uh, with that type of technology. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Ladies and gentlemen, any uh, any more questions? Okay, well listen, I thank you all very much for your patience. As a reminder, Link Market Services attendance will be available to collect your voting cards at the exits from this room. Should you have any questions in relation to how to record your vote, please ask one of the Link attendants. The polls will close 15 minutes after the close of this meeting. Results of the individual votes will be notified to the ASX in accordance with the Corps Act and will also be placed on the company's website. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the company, and the board, I'd like to thank you for your attendance today and now declare this meeting closed. Thank you very much.